Today, um, speaking about outside the box, I thought I'd talk a little bit about inflection points. An inflection point is a point in the curve that changes the shape of the curve. And the factors that are involved in changing the shape of the curve, as you can see in this slide, come after the shape of the curve has changed. I'll come to this topic a little bit later during my talk. I started my career in research in 1982 when I wanted to do my PhD at the Cancer Research Institute in Parel, Bombay. This is me in 1982 working on an Apple computer at that time. I did my PhD with Dr. M.G. Dev, and one of the questions he asked me during my interview for PhD was, how does cervical cancer cause disease? And my true and honest answer at that time was, sir, I don't know the answer. But it is these questions that I feel like answering is why I'm applying to Cancer Research Institute. Later on, he told me it is because of this truthful answer that I got admission into that prestigious institution. The inflection point that occurred to me in the Cancer Research Institute, the premier Cancer Research Institute, was the project that I was supposed to work on was developing a leprosy vaccine. Only later in my career did I actually learn that leprosy is one of those diseases where all aspects of immunology can be studied. So I learned a lot of immunology during my PhD. During that process, I went on to uh, uh, Cornell University Medical College, where I did my uh, postdoctoral fellowship, and I had an opportunity to work on the pathogenesis of AIDS. 1986, 87, the virus had just been discovered. The receptor for the virus was being discovered. How HIV causes immune suppression was being discovered. Cornell was the epicenter of this study, and I was in the midst. I was learning virus immunology like there's no tomorrow. A huge inflection point in my career. I then got an opportunity to work with one of the premier institutions in the world, University of Pennsylvania, with Jim Wilson, to work on gene therapy. And this was 1996. The field of gene therapy had reached astronomical heights. The gene for cystic fibrosis had been cloned, and people were th starting to think about curing genetic diseases with gene therapy using adenoviral vectors. What is adenovirus? It's the common cold. The way you do gene therapy is you take the virus, take out the genes of the virus, replace them with the gene that you want to transmit into your lung, infect the lungs, in this case, with um, adenovirus, and lo and behold, your normal gene is expressed in your lungs. We did a clinical trial on a similar deficiency called ornithine transcarbamylase. It's a deficiency of a gene in patients. When they don't have this gene, the children die of brain damage. That is because this enzyme is required to convert protein into urea. In the absence of this enzyme, the metabolism changes and the protein converts to ammonia, which goes to the brain, and the children die of brain encephalopathy. The, the, the disease is very good for treatment of gene therapy because it's a single gene defect, meaning if you correct this gene, you will correct the disease. It is localized to the liver, and the mouse model of this disease has been corrected. So we undertook the trial where we use this adenovirus, put the normal OTC gene into the virus, and gave patients the intravenous injection of this virus, which entered the liver, and this patient now would have normal OTC gene, and therefore should be corrected of this disease. The goal was to establish safety of the adenovirus vector. What happened? This is a graph which on the y-axis measures toxicity, which is safety, and on the x-axis is just the increasing patient number. 
when we measure toxicity, you generally expect a linear curve. Every patient will get a little bit more toxicity. But that did not happen with this, with this trial. The first 18 patients had very, very minimal adverse events, with safety adverse events. The 19th patient died. It changed the field. The trial was stopped. Postmortem of this child showed it was a multi-organ failure with insult to the bone marrow, to the liver, to lungs, to brain, and, the spl and spleen. In scientific and clinical terms, it's called disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. It's like a septic shock. The lessons we learned from this trial, failed trial, was that the clinical protocol is actually a contract with the patient and the regulators. It is very critical to report every event in the trial and every result that leads to the trial. And informed consents require third-party participation. There were a lot of other lessons, but these are the three main ones that academic institutions learned during the development of clinical trials in an academic setting. There was a turning point, inflection point, in the field of gene therapy. Everything came to a crashing halt. Jim Wilson is a pioneer in the field of gene therapy. He was the, the director of the institute or director of the clinical trial that just failed uh, magnanimously. He didn't stop hard there. He moved from adenoviruses to what are called adeno-associated viruses. These viruses, adeno-associated viruses, don't cause any known human disease. And therefore, they could have been, or they may be, a very good vector for transmitting genes. And they, don't, they may not cause inflammation like adenovirus did. And he discovered a whole range of different viruses, which could be AAV viruses, which could be used. Using these AAV viruses in the next decade in University of Pennsylvania, there was a revolution in the field of gene therapy. Literally this year, in 2018, Jean Bennett, with a team of large and beautiful individuals, have treated and cured this disease of patients having retinal pigment epithelial gene defect. And they have, it's a cure for this kind of, of, of blindness using gene therapy, using AAV vectors. Kathy High, she has used factor eight and factor nine, and they're doing clinical trials in late phase, which can be a potential cure for hemophiliacs. All of these beautiful results of gene therapy using vectors surfaced because of that inflection point that happened a decade ago. I, mo I then moved to Merck from University of Pennsylvania in 2000. There, I had an unusual experience by that time. About 10 years experience in Cornell University Medical College learning about HIV and HIV pathogenesis but five or six years experience working on adenoviral vectors to, to transduce genes. That's what my experience was at that point. And Merck was interested in developing an HIV vaccine, which is for preventing HIV using adenoviral vectors. It's a very interesting design in 2007. Before we get to the vaccine itself, one slide on very basic vaccine immunology. We all get vaccinated with all kinds of vaccines. And we've been vaccinated, vaccines have been available for the last 60, 70, 80 years. We get vaccinated with hepatitis A, hepatitis B, DTP, polio, all kinds of vaccines. Most of the vaccines that we get vaccinated against elicit an antibody response by the body, which means our B cells, which is one type of immune response, secretes antibodies which then protect us from getting infected with that virus. With HIV, it's slightly different. HIV enters inside the cell and stays inside the cell. So the thought in 2000, 2007 timeframe was, if there's a virus inside the cell, you need to activate another part of the immune system, which is called the T cell, and that T cell should be able to kill the virus-infected cell. 
That was the theory of developing this vaccine, for which we did a clinical trial, again using adenovirus, the same common cold virus, but instead of putting a gene in it, what we, what we did was we, we put the gene for HIV gag, which is one of the viral, HIV viral proteins, with the theory that it'll activate T cells in the body, which are specific to HIV, and they will kill the virus-specific T cells. Now, this study was a placebo-controlled blinded trial uh, in subjects with high-risk behavior. The goal of the vaccine was to reduce the probability of getting HIV infection. And this is the result. A dramatically unexpected result in the field of vaccinology. Patients who were infected, shown in the red bar, had a higher probability of getting HIV infection than the controls. Very unexpected result. This is exactly opposite of what you would expect a vaccine to do. What lesson did we learn? We learned that human, non-human primates, on which all the previous work had been done, where it showed that if you activate a T-cell response, you can actually prevent monkeys from getting infected. That model doesn't work in humans. Human immune responses are slow. Some, there's something different about human responses that it doesn't mimic what we see in animals. When we designed the clinical trial, new kinds of clinical trials have been now started to be used for HIV, which is what are called adaptive designs. You do a particular portion of the trial, you observe something, you change the design, and then you observe something else, and then you change the design. This way, you reduce the risk to the patient over time. And then finally, the use of social and behavioral research during vaccine studies. So what happened to the field? We still don't have a vaccine for HIV. I've been fortunate to be part of the NIH's uh, vaccine committee, where I'm part of the process to review proposals for vaccine research. What this slide shows, for the first 20 years, 1980 to about 2000, the whole focus of HIV vaccines was to develop classical vaccines, develop an antibody response, and you will protect against, the, against HIV. Many trials were tried and many failed. In 2000 to 2007, the field started focusing on, it is the T cell. We need the T cell to activate the vaccine. That study failed. We just, I just showed you the data on that. So now the thinking is, it is not that, it is the combination of T and B cells that you need to get a protective vaccine. Time will tell whether such a vaccine will be developed for the world. Very challenging problem. Fast forward to 2008 to 2018. India, biotechnology sector, valued at almost a billion, $11 billion today, $293 billion worldwide, growth rate of 20%. Led the leads the charge in biopharmaceutical industry. In biopharmaceutical industry is developing at a very high rate. In 2015, after almost 30 years of spending, my spending in the US in various institutions, I decide that I want to come back to India and help the process in developing biologics. I was very attracted by the mission statement of Biocon, which is to develop affordable health care. And we all know Kiran Mizumdar Shaw is an inspiration leader, and Arun Chandavakar, who's the CEO, are visionary leaders for the company on this mission. I joined Biocon. Drug development is extremely complicated and extremely expensive. It requires mechanism of action, you need to demonstrate efficacy, and you need to show safety. That gives you a regulatory approval. However, to reach the patient, you need to have value and you need to have access. Patients need to have access to this drug. So last year, I'm proud to say that Biocon got the first approval ever of any company in India by the FDA, Trastuzumab, which is a tr drug for breast cancer. And that was a huge accomplishment by Biocon. Thank you. A huge team of people have done this work. And I'll end my talk by two, two slides. One, I talked about the inflection points in my career that changed the curve of the shape of my career's curve. Like I said, 
inflection points you just do the things that you are passionate about and the inflection point will be behind you you can never focus on an inflection point it's never in front of you it's always behind you when you do things an inflection point will appear behind you so you can't think about inflection points and final slide on culture is i feel i started off my career by being truthful and honest and i think these are the es essential elements of cultures of organizations people individual societies that will make things happen and we need lots of inflection points to make things happen thank you very much <laughs>